Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. How are you today? Fine. Has God been good to you? Yes. He has been good to me. And I know deep down inside <clears throat> that in spite of everything that is happening, I still have a lot to be grateful for. Yes. By the way, children, young people, I do appreciate a story this morning. Mm -hmm. Nice and sweet. I did tell them last week when I did the children's story that the time would be coming when we calling on them to do the story. I didn't appreciate that it would come so early. But I'm so glad that you were with him. And we have appreciated it. So I'll change your names, the famous three. <laughs> Since you are the first three to accept the challenge. And may God continue to bless you and your parents as they seek to bring you up to fear the Lord. The topic of today's message is the Word of God. And if you notice the scripture reading and the opening song and the second hymn of song, you could get a sense of the message today. The, memory, the text we read first says, the words, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Why? Because I'm called by thy name, O God, O Lord of God. This is Jeremiah talking. A number of years ago, a wealthy Englishman became sick and he died. When the day came for the reading of his will and the distribution of his fortune, his favorite daughter was bitterly disappointed. The father had designed I designated in the will that she was to receive my Bible and all that it contained. As time went by, this young lady took ill and hardship of life caused her to spend all that she had and she became you know, somewhat poor. She decided one day that, guess what? I am going to look on my, my, my father's Bible. You know, all this time she had hidden the Bible in a trunk somewhere. But when hard times got to her, she decided since my dad loved his Bible so much and appreciated it so much, I'm going to look in this Bible and see what it contained. As she turned some of the pages, she found that between some of the pages, her father had hidden large banknotes. So all this time, she suffered poverty and hardship. She was somewhat rich. But she didn't read God's word. She didn't open the Bible to find out this Bible that her dad gave her with her so many riches in it. My Bible and all that it 
condemned, condemned. Our Heavenly Father has left us a great treasure in the pages of his wonderful book. He has left us wonderful treasures in this wonderful book. And you know, many of us worry ourselves to death, almost to death sometimes. And we need, by His grace, to take up His word and read it. And as we read God's word, we get comfort. We get comfort. I've said to you before that my wife is ill now. And those who know about her know she cooks very well. Sometimes she would prepare breakfast and she'll call me upstairs, Ron, come now, breakfast is ready. But there are times when I'm maybe preaching like this week and I'm studying my Bible. And when Janet calls me, the last thing I want to do is eat. Because the word of God is sweet. And sometimes when studying the word, I find it so sweet I don't want to leave it. No wonder the Bible says, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And I've often maintained, you can't compel anybody to come to Jesus. Can you? No. And when you share God's word, you can get so excited. But the greatest story you can tell is what Jesus has done for you. Jesus changes us. He changes our appetites. Yes. He changes our appetites. We got different taste buds as we fall in love with Jesus. But you have to taste it for yourself. Nobody, but nobody can impart to you God's word. They can tell you about it, but you have to taste it for yourself. And do you know, I've known a lot of people who passed away. They're sleeping in the grave. Some of them were ardent Christians. But the one thing you cannot desire, you know, designate to anybody is salvation. We have to taste God for ourselves. And how can you do that? You do it by finding time to spend with Jesus' Christ. I've seen today, there's a whole lot of problem in the world. Can't you see? I was talking to somebody this week, talking about the seriousness of the times. Folks are so very busy. And the last thing so many people want to do is to spend time with God's Word. Anything else but God's Word. And I know that is happening to, us, to some of us as Christians. But my message to you today is no matter what is happen, happening, spend time with Jesus' Word. When difficulties come, and heartaches, and pain, and sickness, and death. Our comfort is in God's word. Yes. Our comfort is in God's word. Yes. No friends can comfort us when only Jesus can. And I know that when God created us, he created each of us with a certain spot in our hearts that only he can feel. And it doesn't matter what you have in this world. If that spot is filled by Jesus, nobody else can fill it. No mother can fill it. No father can. No friends can. No wife can. No husband can. No daughter can. 
No son can, only Jesus can do it. Thy word were found, Jeremiah said. I did eat it, and thy word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Yes, the Bible is the only one, only thing that can satisfy our longing to Jesus Christ. Million years today, it says priceless treasures, forgotten riches, are found in God's word. What greater treasure can a man hope for? Many a millionaire would exchange the fortune, their fortune, for these valuables. Sad to say, though that millions are worrying and grieving their lives away because they have not learned how to find the answer to their difficulties in the good old book. Too much TV, too many things to do, and too many problems to solve have robbed mankind of the time needed to let God speak to their heart and mind throughout his word. Time spent with Jesus is never lost. Time spent with Jesus is never lost. Many think the Bible is too difficult to understand and it is too boring. The fact is they never open the book and thus they cheat themselves of joy, comfort, peace, and possibly eternal salvation. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, verse 4. And you know, Jesus found this to be true, and you and I can find it true to our own selves. points to ponder. Somebody said the Bible is the best selling and most read book in the world. Why is it so? The question is the Bible answers the deepest longing of the human heart and that longing is, longing is to be loved and to belong. Christians believe the Bible is inspired why? Because the Bible changes people's lives and changes people's hearts. Many have no interest in even reading the Bible. They feel trapped with so many demands on their time. What time do they have? when they want to spend this time doing something else important. Many feel religion would only interfere with their plans. The Bible invites us, as I said before, come taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34 verse 8. Without The experience, this experience, they are the losers. Others study the Bible a great deal. As I mentioned before, Jeremiah did it. And many Bible students, Bible characters do it. You and I can do the same. Who wrote the Bible? The Bible's authority for faith and practice comes from the origin, its origin. The writers view the Bible as distinct from other literature. You know, the Bible isn't like any other books you read. No. 
I said before that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. And you know, the Bible can't save us. We can read it from, and listen to me carefully, we can read this Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but it won't save you. The reading of it don't save you. What saves you, you are saved by Jesus' grace, isn't it? But the Bible points us to Jesus, the source and inspiration of our lives. When we read about Jesus, it helps us to ask, it help us to want to be to, to, to be like him. As we read the Bible, as we read sometimes of the wonderful characters in the Bible, my prayer is, Lord, help me to be like this person. Only as the person draws me to Jesus Christ. So, we picture Jesus. And it says in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, by beholding, we become changed. And in your mind's eyes, I'd like you to picture Jesus on that, back, that wall. As you look at him, and you behold him in his beauty, you aspire to be like him, isn't it? And as we aim to be like Jesus, and as we read his words and pray about it, he ans God answers our prayers and helps us to become more and more each day like Jesus. It happens. We have to experience him for ourselves. But you can't do that without spending time with Jesus. If Jesus is my best friend, then I need to spend time with him. I don't know how many friends some of you got. Some of you got a whole lot of friends. <laughs> but I suggest today, if you can find five good friends, you are very fortunate. Yeah. Very fortunate. A good friend stick closer than a brother, the Bible says. This Bible tells me that. A good friend stick to you no matter what. Some friends are just good weather friends. But as soon as difficulty rise, you don't see them. They don't ring you. They don't visit you. They don't write to you. They forget you. But a good friend will stick to you. Stickability. And no matter where they are, you are still their friend. No matter what you do them, they're still your friend. In times of goodness, they are your friend. In sickness, you are your friend. In difficulties, they are your friend. In prosperity, they are your friend. And when you don't see them, even for 10 years, or five years, or two years, when you see them, they're still your friend. You know why? Because they were genuine from the beginning. But many of us have good weather friends. Keep them. But if I can find one good one, two friends, three friends, thank God for them. But then, my prayer is, anybody who accepts me as a friend, I want to be a genuine one. And so if I don't see my friend for five years, or three years, or two years, whenever I see them, they're still my friend. But praise God, I commend to you this morning, this afternoon, a friend who is the closest and the best friend you have had, Sister Lena, and this friend is Jesus Christ. He never let you down. Yes. He never does. Oh my God. I'm so rotten sometimes, you know. <laughs> and I can talk to my Jesus. But as rotten as I get, when I go to him, he never said, get away from me, Ransford. <laughs> no. He's still my friend. He's still my friend. And that is why the Bible tells us, the 
Bible says that holy men of God wrote the Bible as we are moved by the Holy Spirit. And so when you get right down to it, the Bible is God's word. He might not write it with his own fingers, but his chosen men wrote it. Therefore, the Bible is the word of God. It is the word of God. It is the word of God. Today we see all types of things happening all over the world. But the Holy Scriptures is blameless. The uniqueness of the Scriptures is based on their origin and the source. How did the Bible writers claim that they received their message? Some received it, they were able to see the truth. They passed on. See Isaiah 1 verse 1, Amos 1 verse 1, Micah 1 verse 1, Habakkuk 1 verse 1. Who showed these truths to them? Jeremiah 38, 21. God spoke to his prophets by his spirit. And you find that in Nehemiah chapter 2, 9, verse 30. Zechariah 7, verse 20. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. Ezekiel 2, verse 2. And Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 5. Jesus said, that David was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You find that in Mark 12, verse 36. Paul believed that the Holy Spirit spoke through Isaiah. And Peter revealed that the Holy Spirit guided all the prophets, not just a few, but all of them. How did the Holy Spirit communicate to the Bible to its writers? It tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, that what? All scripture is written. By the Holy Spirit. All scripture, let's read it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Wisdom, for knowledge, for understanding, all scripture, not just some, but all. Divine revelation was given by inspiration of God to the holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit. These revelations were embodied in human language with all its limitations and imperfections, yet there remain God's testimony, God-inspired men, not words. So God-inspired men, not words. He chooses, he chooses the men. And you know, he chooses you, he chooses me, he chooses Brother Herbert, he chooses any one of us. But when he gives us his message, he leaves us to write, to, to use the words, isn't it? We use different words, like I'm preaching now, and I'm using different words, hopefully, to explain his message. But somebody from the floor comes and preaches the same message, and they use different words, but the message is the same, because it's inspired by God. So he chooses his men, and he leaves the man to choose his word to present the message. Not too complicated, is it? I don't think so. I don't think so. How was the Bible inspired? Through visions and dreams. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was inspired audibly in the ear. Sometimes you hear, the Bible says, and I hear, shall hear a word behind me saying, this is the way. Walking in it when he turned to the right hand and when he turned to the left. 
So God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, has revealed himself through the Holy Scriptures. He wrote them, not with his hands, but with other hands. And it says about 40 pairs of hands over a period of 1,500 years wrote God's word. Why was the Bible written? Without the Bible, we would not know anything about salvation. Without the Bible, we would not know what is sin. Without the Bible, we would not know that we can find salvation in Jesus Christ. Without the Bible, to help us believe in Jesus and obtain life through this name. When you read God's word in John, it says, the scripture was written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing in him, we may have eternal life. Some people think the Bible is just funny duddy. And even some of you as Christians, some of us are funny duddy people. But I would say, I'd rather be funny duddy following Jesus than following anybody in this world. Why should we study the Bible? I have a few things here. You can, if somebody wants to write them down, you can write down a few. Just, it says, the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. So the Bible makes us holy and it reveals the truth about Jesus Christ to us. It makes us wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15 And so the Bible, as I said before, doesn't save us. Only Jesus saves us through his grace. So I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible is the thing, is the book that draws me to Jesus Christ. The Bible reveals who Jesus is. And it illuminates our path. And so the Bible helps us to understand what it says and means so that we can properly interpret. You know, when, when, when the disciples were preaching, Peter would go and preach and Paul would preach. But you know, they didn't, the people didn't just, under, just grasp what they said. The Bereans, the Bible states, that when the disciples preached, they didn't just accept it. Because I could speak so fluently and suavely. Polish. So polished. You just accept my word and I'm taking you astray. But when you check out what the preacher says in his word, you can't go wrong. So I suggest to you, no matter how plausible, educated, and posh and intelligent preachers come and preach throughout you, up, up to you, check it out with the word of God. So, the Bible helps us to recognize and avoid sin. It helps us to understand what it says and means so that we can properly interpret it. And the Bible protects us from error. Therefore, I suggest to us to equip us. Read the Bible and you will be equipped to do God's work and to serve Him. I soon be finished. Scripture is meant to draw us closer to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> How should we study the Bible? 
Well, I believe you should study the Bible by praying. You should always read. I think it's best to read before we open God's Word. You know why? Because this is spiritually equipped. And without the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand God's Word. Therefore, when we read it, we should ask Him to interpret His Word to us to the person of His Holy Spirit. So, how we should do Bible? We read the Bible by comparing Scripture with Scripture. You read one text and you compare it with something else. And you know, like a jigsaw puzzle, you read a few texts and you say, Lord, what are you trying to say to me through this text? And as you read your Bible and you pray, do you know God hears your prayer? He does. Because His his idea for you and me is to come closer to Him. He wants to draw us closer to Him. He wants us to reflect His character. And when you reflect God's character, people will be drawn to Him through your life. Why should we trust the Bible? I suggest to you that the Bible, do we trust the Bible because the Bible is trustworthy. It was consistently, it has consistently revealed the future with accuracy. And its author is unique in being able to reveal the future and in knowing everything. Daniel could interpret the scripture because he was guided by the Holy Spirit. Why should we believe the Bible's prophecies? I'd like you to turn with me, second, or to note this text, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. It says, so that we can be established and prosper. How does the Bible describe those who don't accept the word of God? Luke 24, verse 25. One of the children, could you read that one very quickly for me, please? Luke. <coughs> chapter 24, verse 25. Have you got the Bible, Conrad? Could you read that for me, please? Luke 24, verse 25. How does the Bible describe those who don't accept the word of God's prophets? Hmm? All foolish ones go to the evil of that process of Yes. So, God is beauty calls people who don't believe in the Bible, he calls them fools. Sometimes because of you want to be what? I'm using a certain phrase. Because we want to be politically correct. We don't call people fools. We say you're foolish. But God has the authority to call us fools. Because he made us, isn't he? And he said that if you don't believe his prophets, we are fools. We are fools. So the Bible describes those who don't accept the word of God, his prophet, as fools. How can we be sure that God has preserved his word from corruption through the many translations. The answer is that he has promised to preserve them. Even though the Bible has been written by 40 authors in three languages and in 66 books over the period of 1600 years and across three continents, it is one it has one consistent message, and that, that the one consistent message is that Jesus 
is our only road to salvation. If you want to be saved, you can only be saved through Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. No riches can save us. No friends can save us. No parent can save us. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. And as I conclude, I'd like to say to us that Jesus endured three tremendous temptations. After fasting 40 years, 40 days, he was really hungry. 40 days, you know, and nights without eating. He was hungry. And the devil, knowing that he was hungry, came to him. Oh, this master devil. No wonder he's called the devil and Satan. <laughs> he's crafty, isn't it? And he attacks us at our weakest point. When we are the weakest, at the weakest stage, that's when he comes. And that's when his temptation is most terrible and rampant. After 40 days not, not eating, he came to Jesus and he looked at him and he says, oh, You're hungry. Why can't you command those stones to be made bread? And if that was you, and if that was me, I would show you where to go, isn't it? <laughs> you eat your bread, make your bread and eat it. But Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And what was in the second temptation? He said, what? All these things will I give to you if you will only fall down and worship me. And what Jesus says to him, just go away from me. You shall not tell the Lord and your God. And what was the third temptation? He took him at the top of the pinnacle. And he says, cast yourself down. And you know what the devil does? You notice he's called scripture, isn't he? He called scripture, but he leave out some part. He promised he will give his angels charge over you to keep you. He, no, he promised to keep, give you the angels charge over you, but he did not call the part which says to keep you in all his ways. So the devil quotes scripture sometimes, and he will quote it to you as well. And if you're not listening, and if you don't know God's word for yourself, you can still, as a Christian, slip up and fall. He quotes scripture, but you always leave on something. And you know, if you are presented 99.9 truth and one point false, it makes that scripture still false. Did you get that? Yeah. It's all of it, not some part of it. So, my brethren, the time of, because of time, I have not preached this message as I should. But I hope you have gotten enough. Because when I was asked to preach and was searching for this message, I had to ask God to give it to me. And he gave me so many messages. But as I've got to this one, I know that this is the one he wanted me to preach to Bilstein today. And I asked him, if it's only one person, Lord, just grant that they will get something from this message today. And if you are that person, I'm happy for you. And may the Lord bless you as you decide by God's grace 
to spend time with Jesus and his word. But time spent with Jesus is never lost. And I know you are very loving people and you love one another. But you must not love anybody about Jesus Christ. Because all the him can say was, May God bless you as you spend time feeding on his word. Amen.